Welcome to the worship service for August 22nd, 2021, Pentecost 13 of the church year. The service was held at Grace Lutheran Church of Mosinee, Wisconsin, Pastor Paul Vander Gallion. Our sermon text is based on John chapter 6, verses 51 through 58, in which Jesus encourages us to be involved with him, referring to himself as the bread of life and us eating of that bread and receiving spiritual blessings. We begin with our opening hymn, Speak, O Savior, I Am Listening, sung by the members of Grace Lutheran Church. Here ends our first lesson. We continue. 
Second lesson is from St. Paul's letter to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than the two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we focus on our gospel lesson, which Jesus continues his teaching that he is the bread of life. Today we focus on the blessings that he promises to give to those who are connected to him. From John chapter 6, beginning at verse 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is God's Word. Dear friends in Christ, undoubtedly you have heard the phrase, you are what you eat. And that teaches us that the types of things that we put into our body has an impact on our health. Um, it might be even something a bit more than that. Um, one scientific study says that our cells, most of them anyway, are replaced every seven years. It's a gradual process, so the types of foods and nutrients and drinks that you take into your body uh, get into your cells, and so it has a big impact in changing you to a healthier person if you're eating right, or a not so healthy person if you're not. But, but you are what you eat, so we understand that it does have an impact on our lives, the type of things that we bring into our bodies. As I was kind of studying that, I came across some different articles, and they said, well, if you're not really feeling that well, and you're kind of sluggish and lethargic, and, and you know, maybe you need to look at your diet and look at um, the types of foods that would have a better impact on your life and, and make a conscious decision that if I eat these types of foods and drink these type of drinks and take these type of medications, that that's going to have a positive impact. It might not be the very next day, but down the road it can have a very positive impact. And so um, that article also used uh, an exaggeration. It said, um, answer these questions honestly and be aware of the ways in which your body is trying to communicate with you about your food choices. If it is not totally happy, change what you are doing. How you go about it is completely up to you. There are a gazillion diet books out there. I don't know if there's a text. There's a lot. And then it says, um, some are better than others. But you need to find something that meets your specific needs. So if you're concerned about your health and, and how you're feeling and, and you believe that you are what you eat, you can make that conscious choice to change your diet if you want to be feeling better. You are what you eat. Uh, historically, that phrase first came out in the early 1800s in France. A uh, doctor came up with that in a treatise that he wrote. He says, tell me what you eat, and I'll tell you what you like. Does that mean before that, it didn't matter what you ate? That you weren't what you ate until this guy discovered this? No, um, certainly it has always had an impact on people. You read through the Bible. And you see that the Bible has a lot to say about what God's people were to eat and what they were not to eat. Now, it wasn't so much um, just for health reasons. You know, because some of the foods that they were not allowed to eat really are very healthy foods to be eating. Um, God's laws about clean and unclean foods and, and how to prepare some of them. Uh, that had more to do with um, showing that they were God's people separate from the... the uh, ungodly people around them. And yet God did talk a lot about, write about, command a lot about, um, about dietary things and eating. And we realize, of course, that those ceremonial laws directed to the Israelite people about you know, whether or not they could eat bacon or ham or lobster, that um, they were part of the ceremonial laws that pointed into Christ. So we can, in good conscience, um, for religious purposes, not worry about whether or not we're eating those type of foods. Our choices would be for different reasons. Aside from that, there's kind of an interesting story in the Bible about the almost immediate healthy impact that eating certain types of foods had on some of God's people. And those people are familiar to us. Daniel, he's famous for the <coughs> lion's den. Right? Daniel thrown into the lion's den. And then there was three men at the same time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
What are they famous for? Fiery Furnace. That was one of our lessons for Vacation Bible School a couple weeks ago, too. So. There's another story about them, though, and it's um, from uh, Daniel chapter 1, and um, kind of summarize that. Um, these men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're among the people who have been captured from Israel and taken into captivity in Babylon. And what the Babylonians did was they, they chose people that were highly qualified and intelligent and, and could learn, and they trained them to help supervise, let's see, specifically the other captives. But they chose these people, and they, they were training them. And, and part of one of the privileges of being in that court and being trained was that they were given what the Babylonian king thought was the best of foods, choice meats and wine, and, and who, who doesn't enjoy, you know, steak and a glass of wine or something, but they were, so you, you need to eat these things, and Daniel objected, he says, no, that's not for us, um, we, we just want to eat vegetables, which no child has ever said to me, that they want to eat vegetables, but Daniel and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wanted vegetables, and, and the official said, well, I can't really do that, it's king's order, and, and Daniel said, well, put us to the test. For the next 10 days, just feed us vegetables and water and um, see how it turns out. And if we're sicker than the people eating meat and drinking wine, well then feed us meat and wine, but if we're healthier, and after 10 days, you're healthier. And so from then on, they were fed you know, vegetables and water. So they, you see an example of, of that impact. I, I wonder if that would be a good test to do for the next 10 days to just eat vegetables and drink water and how that would make somebody feel. It's not a command, it's just an idea. But they realized, and they could see that, what they ate had an impact. In that case, a positive impact. But that being said, uh, many years before that, this takes place about 600 BC, uh, Solomon, in writing Proverbs about 900 BC, uh, kind of tips his hand as to what he liked to eat. He says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 17, better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fattened calf with hatred. So he's saying love is better than hatred, but he's also saying that, not given the choice, he'd rather have meat instead of vegetables. And, uh, the point is we are impacted by the by what we take into our bodies. But Jesus uses that to teach that we are greatly impacted by what we take into our, our minds, our thought processes, our beliefs, and our commitment. And he uses the example of food to teach that point. And so we go to our gospel lesson, again, a continuation of a longer discourse that Jesus is having with people after the feeding of the 5,000, so he's talking about himself as the bread of life. And he starts out this section by saying, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So the first point is um, the origins of Jesus. He says, I have come from heaven. Now we know that there were angels who came from heaven on short assignments to make announcements, that type of thing. But for someone living on earth and among the people and, and being a human being, Jesus is unique in that he has an origin that takes place before his conception. Although the ancient Greeks, and in some teaching of Islam to this day, there's an idea that a person's soul exists before we're conceived, either eternally or created at some point in time. And I think the, the Mormon church teaches that too. It's not a biblical teaching, and it's rejected by Christianity. So for us, we did not exist before our conception. But at our conception, then we became you know, body and soul. But with Jesus, he did exist before his conception. True God from all eternity, as we confess in the Nicene Creed, that Jesus has always existed as true God. And then in time, he also became true man through the miracle of the Incarnation. Jesus isn't really teaching deep theology here. He's really just making a point. He says, I'm, I'm from heaven. I'm, I'm sent by the living Father. And my teachings 
are from God. Elsewhere he would say, the teachings I teach, I do not teach on my own, but they come from my Father who sent me. And so he's talking about his authority, where he's from, um, the power of his, his teachings, the word that he is proclaiming to people. So, but I, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. But then he moves on to some figurative language. Figurative language means you don't take it literally, uh, but it has a deeper meaning behind it. As Jesus often does in his parables, as he does when he calls himself a good shepherd, as John does when he says concerning Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as the book of Revelation does in many ways as well. Jesus moves into figurative language. He says, if anyone eats of this bread, so he calls himself bread, and then he talks about eating him. Eating of this bread. He says, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So he moves from the figurative to the literal, because he will give his life on the cross for the life of the world, to, to save the world. But he, he makes this statement, this bread is my flesh, and this eat of my bread, you'll have eternal life. And the Jews begin to argue, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus does not answer that question. He goes on to talk about the blessings that are received when we figuratively eat his flesh and drink his blood. But, but they ask a good question. Their, their purpose of asking it isn't so good. They, they doubt what Jesus is saying. They don't want to be committed to him. They're just refusing to believe anything he has to say. And that's why I say, well, how can he give us flesh to eat? But, but we do well to ask the good Lutheran question, what does this mean? Well, it's not literal. Jesus isn't advocating cannibalism, of course. Can't do that. <clears throat> what he says here sounds familiar to words we'll hear later on in the worship service in the Lord's Supper. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. Is Jesus possibly referring to the Lord's Supper and be connected with him to the sacrament? Most likely not. Uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Lord's Supper wouldn't be instituted for another year, so why would Jesus be talking about something that people had no idea what he's referring to hadn't happened yet? Uh, another reason is because of the promise that Jesus makes. This is, you know, my body, eat my flesh. No one who, anyone who does not eat my flesh does not have eternal life. And, and we can't say that's true of the Lord's Supper because there are Christians who have not eaten of the Lord's Supper, who still have eternal life. So Jesus can't be referring to the Lord's Supper in that regard. What is he talking about? Eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Well, after this, people understand that Jesus is asking for something, a deep commitment on their part. And you will notice this at times. If you've got people that are going along with you and, and, and doing things with you and you know supporting something you're doing, but when you start to ask for a deep commitment, <laughs> you ask them for more time, more talents, more charity to fully devote themselves to a cause, what are some people likely to say? That's enough for me. I'm, I'm out of here. And I don't think they literally said, I'm out of here. But we are told that right after this, we'll talk about that next week, that a lot of people who have been there listening to Jesus, it was too hard for them to grasp the commitment Jesus is demanding, and they left. And then Jesus turns to his most committed followers, his 12 disciples, and he says, you're not going to go too hard. And Peter speaks up for them and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so they understood that being connected to Jesus and eating his flesh and drinking his blood had to do with how they were responding to the word of God that Jesus was teaching. Were they willing to believe what Jesus was saying? Were they willing to grasp and trust in him as the Messiah? Were they willing to devote themselves to this person who was making some astounding promises? But So are they willing to be deeply committed and connected to Jesus? 
And I believe that's what Jesus means here. So instead of saying, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood can't have eternal life, Jesus is saying, in order to receive these wonderful spiritual blessings, you need to have this commitment to me. A commitment which is a gift from God. Last week we heard that no one comes to me unless the Father has drawn him. But here Jesus is saying, okay, the Father has drawn you. You have this connection. You're hearing my words. You're believing in me. Now, be fully invested in me. And when you do that, you will be blessed. And those are the promises that he's making here. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. So who's ever connected to Jesus right now has this eternal life right now, has the forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven, salvation, answered prayers, knowing that God is for them. So who could be against them? Knowing that God works out all things for our good. Knowing that we have this living and enduring relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. That's something we have right now. In the future, I will raise him up at the last day. Raise us from what? Raise us from the dead. Unless Jesus returns first, we have recognized that we will be like the Jewish forefathers in the desert who ate man and die. We, we know that no matter what, how many vegetables we eat, or how much water we drink, or how we control our diet, or what medications we take, eventually, unless Jesus returns first, we're going to die. We might leave a healthier body than somebody else, but we're still going to die. But Jesus said, I will raise you up on the last day. Because you're connected to me. So whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And that's uh, during this lifetime too. That uh, There's this connection with Jesus, this blessing we have that is so impactful. And which is ours through not seeing Jesus physically with us right now, but it is through the living and enduring word of God which Jesus was teaching, and which we continue to be taught even to this day. And how important that is. Oftentimes, when I teach a lesson on Jesus Christ, or begin my lessons on Jesus Christ in confirmation class, I will ask the students to write down, uh, probably in their notebook, you know, some, just someplace to write down, a couple of names, uh, a lot of discussions, just, just write down the names of, of three people that are famous. It surprises me sometimes the names that they put down and that I don't know who they are. <laughs> well, I write down some names, they don't have any idea who they are either, so it's, it's kind of a history type thing. But the, you know, I'll write some names and then I'll say, okay, why is that person important to you? You wrote their name down. And then they'll say, well, they're the President of the United States or they're a leader of a musical group or a good friend of mine, usually it's a celebrity, but it's okay. Now, how important is it that you know who this person is? I can say, how important is it that you know anything about Napoleon Bonaparte? You can say, Napoleon who? And I'll say, well, or how important is it that you know about um, you know, an obscure president of the United States? Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. I have no idea anything about him. And I'll go, said, how important is it that you know about Giannis Antetokounmpo? And I'll go, well, oh, he's in the but that, does it really matter in your life? And I'm like, no, it's okay. Who do you think the most important person is? And some of them probably had written down his name in that list, but they didn't have any restrictions. And that's Jesus. So how important is it to be connected to him? And the they already know because these are seventh and eighth graders who've been taught the word of God and they're before that and come to believe in Jesus and say, well, it's, it's only by faith in Jesus that I have eternal life. So that's absolutely true. And so let's let's talk about just more of the details about the life of Jesus and what he did and how he still impacts our lives today. And so and that begins the second article of the Apostles' Creed is a point of catechism that teaching. We spent several lessons on that. But the point is, knowing about Jesus, believing in Jesus, being connected to Jesus, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, 
that has a great impact on our lives in the ways that Jesus promises here. Eternal life now, be raised at the last day, eternal life forever in heaven. This, this him remaining in us. And so I, we would all agree that's so important. And as Peter said, the way of being connected with Jesus is through the words of eternal life. And that's so important for us because we are not only what we eat as far as our physical health is concerned. I would maintain, and I don't think you can disagree, that we also are impacted by what we read, by what we are told, by what others believe, by outside forces. Um, there's a phrase in, in more modern terms with computers, they say garbage in, garbage out, whatever. You can only get out of a computer what you put into it. You know, it's just the way programming works. Um, we have a little bit more um, will in, in, in the computer, but we are impacted by the types of things that we watch, the conversations that we have, and the input that's coming from other people, and that, that really does impact our thinking. I think we're learning we can't trust everything we hear, right? Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. We often say it the other way. It's on the internet, it must be true, but we know it's not. But if we believe that the Bible is what it says it is, that it is the Word of God, that He is the one who inspired these men to write these words so many years ago, and they are just as impactful today as they ever were. Being involved in the Word of God is our way of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking His blood. And we pray about that. At the end, near the end of the worship service, um, we often have a, well, right before the benediction, there's, there's a collect, which is a prayer. And, and um, there's a choice. You can either pray for the Holy Spirit or it's a call for the Word, praying for our use of the Word of God. And although we're not using that prayer today specifically, but on the page 15 liturgy, um, we have this prayer, and I'm going to quiz you a little bit in just a moment, so listen carefully. So it says, Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and... What comes next? Hmm? Okay. Read, mark, learn, and? Who said that? Glenn. Inwardly digest. That is not in Christian worship, in the hymnal that we use. It's the way I remember it. It's the way I prefer. In, in Christian worship, it says, take them to heart. But I like that old phrase. Inwardly digest. We are asking God that we would feed on the Word of God. We are asking God that we would feed on Jesus' flesh and drink His blood. And it's, it's a reference to the Word of God. So I like the inward word digest, and I'm glad that you got the answer I was looking for, which I do I so thank you. And then, why do we pray for this? So that we may be strengthened and comforted by your Holy Word. It takes place now in time. And may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we recognize that when Jesus is talking about being connected to him and eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he's really saying, stay connected with me through the word of God. And that as that word permeates us and fills us, we have increased blessings which Jesus promised oh so many years ago in John chapter 6. So may that be our prayer at all times, that we stay connected to Jesus through the Word of God and be renewed in our, our hope of the blessings that Jesus promises. Amen. Peace of God. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen.